Thank you for listening, downloading, sharing, subscribing, commenting, donating, and praying for us. And for going to BrotherLance.com to get the free PDF of this teaching. Condition-minded people think about themselves too much. I'll just say that right now. And the devil knows if you focus on yourself too much, then you can't focus on Christ. You can't focus on God, right? But position-minded people focus on Christ and Jesus more often, okay? So my actual spiritual position is in heaven with Christ Jesus. My physical position is here on the earth. It's my condition, right? And so we have to kind of look at this. So I put a little breakdown here. It says, um... Number one, condition is how we are in our sinful flesh. Position is who we are in the love of our Father. Okay, second example. Condition-oriented people focus solely on their behavior. Position-oriented people focus on who they are in Christ. Mm -hmm. Another example. Condition-oriented people fail to know who they are in Christ. Position-oriented people rely in, on and live by who they are in Christ. In other words, we focus on our standing, our position, our, our, how God sees us, not how we're seeing ourselves, okay? Top of page two. It says, your condition can never make you a better person. It's impossible. We're all sinners, okay? Your position is your only hope for a better life. In other words, since God has elevated you to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus, that is what helps you become a better human being. Not focusing on your sinful flesh, right? And the next one, your condition will destroy you, right? And then number two, your position will change you. So the whole goal of this Bible study is to get us to focus on the example of our condition and compare it to what the Bible says our position in Jesus Christ is. Yahweh bless you and keep you. Yahweh make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. Yahweh lift up his counts upon you and give you shalom. Amen. Let's pray. Dear and Father, we praise you. We thank you for all you have, our and will ever do for us, for giving us hope in this life, uh, for allowing us to get back together again, for Darian being here with us today. It's always a blessing to have new people join. And so we ask uh, he'd be blessed in his time here and feel welcome. Uh, thank you for this rain. We need it desperately and uh, keep the fires away and make that green grass green. And so we glorify your name in that. Thank you for giving us hope in this life, Father. We ask for the Holy Spirit to guide us in our Bible study to understand what we're hearing and reading and apply our hearts our minds and lead me in it and uh so we can understand the difference between our condition versus our position in christ so we love you very much in jesus name we pray amen amen all right so this is part 23 of escape from babylon so condition versus position focusing on who you are in christ not your sinful flesh it says as we are escaping babylon it is an effective trick of the devil to get us focused on our condition he does this because he knows that if we focus on our position in Christ, he will lose control over us. It will be a worthwhile it, it will be worthwhile to accurately discuss the difference as we become more informed on the difference between the two. My hope is what we can uh, be on guard and spot this type of attack from Satan. When our minds drift to the struggles of the flesh, may we then focus on who we are in Christ Jesus and tell that silver-tongued serpent the truth. Now, this Bible study, I always try to be upfront about this stuff. This, this type of Bible study of condition versus position is a teaching that's been in the church for a long time, okay? And some of the influence is in this Bible study. So if I make all the Bible study, then I don't say anything. But if I've taken things from things I've heard and stuff, that's one of these, okay? And so uh, now I did a ton more to it, but uh, fleshed it out a little bit. So it's not something new. It's not revolutionary, but it's w very worthwhile in hearing. And so we're going to go ahead and read our first verse. It says, 1 Peter 5, 6 through 11. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time, casting all your worries on him because he cares for you. Be sober and self-controlled. Be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Without him, uh, withstand him 
steadfast in your faith, knowing that your brothers who are in the world are undergoing the same sufferings. And by, uh, But may the God of all grace, who called you to his eternal glory by Christ Jesus, after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, and strengthen, and settle you. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And so on all these recent Bible studies we're doing, we're doing things that are slowing people down. We're focusing on tricks of the devil. We're fi- focusing on what is preventing people from taking their walk in Christ seriously, right? And so like last week, we did once saved, always saved, and we did need to share the gospel. And so this one's condition versus position. And so in in short, before we get going, condition-minded people think about themselves too much. I'll just say that right now. And the devil knows if you focus on yourself too much, then you can't focus on Christ. You can't focus on God, right? But position-minded people focus on Christ and Jesus more often, okay? So let's see. Ephesians 2, 6 says, And God has raised us up together and made us sit in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So I put a note. So if I ask you, where am I at right now? Where would you say that I am physically? I am here on earth. This is my condition. Yet this Bible verse tells me that my position is with God in heaven, thanks to Jesus Christ. So I'll read the verse one more time, Ephesians 2, 6. And, and God has raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So my actual spiritual position is in heaven with Christ Jesus. My physical position is here on the earth. It's my condition, right? And so we have to kind of look at this. So I put a little breakdown here. It says, um, number one, condition is how we are in our sinful flesh. Position is who we are in the love of our Father. Okay, second example. Condition-oriented people focus solely on their behavior. Position-oriented people focus on who they are in Christ. Mm -hmm. Another example. Condition-oriented people fail to know who they are in Christ. Position-oriented people rely in, on and live by who they are in Christ. In other words, we focus on our standing, our position, our, our, how God sees us, not how we're seeing ourselves, okay? Top of page two. It says, your condition can never make you a better person. It's impossible. We're all sinners, okay? Your position is your only hope for a better life. In other words, since God is elevated you to sit in heavenly places with Christ Jesus. That is what helps you become a better human being, not focusing on your sinful flesh, right? And the next one, your condition will destroy you, right? And then number two, your position will change you. So the whole goal of this Bible study is to get us to focus on the example of our condition and compare it to what the Bible says our position in Jesus Christ is. So we're going to do a comparison check. It says the word saint in the Greek language means holy ones, right? And so I'm not going to try to read all the Greek, but I'll read the definition. So saint from the Strong's Concordance, G40 says, uh, says from Hagios, an awful thing compared G53, sacred, physically, pure, morally blameless or religious, ceremonially consecrated, most holy thing, a saint. And the total occurrence of the word saint in the King James in the New Testament is 229 times. Okay. Now sinner is G268. From the Strong's Concordance, it says, sinful, that is a sinner, sinful sinner, all right? And the total occurrences is 47 times. So, saint, the amount of times it occurs in the New Testament is 229 times. The word sinner in the New Testament is 47 times. Mm-hmm. And so, so, we can clearly see that the focus of the New Testament is not upon the sinner, but the saint from the ratio of 4.8 to 1, Right? So why Christ and God in the New Testament has to tell us of our sinful condition to help us to become a saint, the primary focus in the New Testament is that we're saints, right? And so we have to walk as saints, think as saints. We don't, it's easy, well, I'm just a sinner, I'm just sinful flesh, I'm just, you know, woe is me, blah, 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 right? But no, it's like you've been elected to an office and God is calling you to rise up to your position, right? So you've been elected, at the Bible calls you the elect, elected to be a saint, to be a holy one, not to be a sinful sinner. So we have to get out of our minds, well, I'm just a sinful sinner. Well, no, you're not anymore. God has called you saint. Don't call God a liar. He told you, you are now a sacred, most holy one. Don't give yourself an excuse or an allowance to fall back into your er, er, evil, dirty tricks. Okay? So, before we get going, I'm going to drink here. So, we're going to go back and forth in Scripture. We're going to look at condition 
and we're going to compare it to position, and I'll break it up for us, okay? Condition versus pos position versus. When we submit to God and throw off our rebellion, God does not deal with us according to our sinful condition. He addresses us in the light of our position, which we now have, thanks to the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, a position-focused relationship, mm -hmm. okay? So I put how I am. And then versus who I am. So condition, how I am. This is what the Bible says, how we are. Romans 7, 18 through 21. For I know that it, in me, that is, my in my flesh, dwells no good thing. For desire is present with me, but I don't find it doing that which is good. For the good which I desire, I don't do. But the evil which I don't desire, that I practice. That's a human being. But if what I don't desire that I do... It is no more I that do it, but it's the sin that dwells in me or in my flesh. I find that the, then the law that it to me, while I desire to do good, is evil is present. So that one in that verse, he's saying, listen, the things I don't want to do, that's what I'm doing. What I want to do, I can't do that. And I, I'm at, at war at myself because this is how I am as a human being. OK, so let's compare that to our position. It says who I am. Ephesians 1, 3 through 9. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ. Even as he chose us in him before the very foundation of the world that we would be holy and without defect before him in love, having predestined us for adoption as children through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his desire, to the praise of the glory of his grace, by which we freely gave us favor in the beloved. Hmm, this is good stuff. In whom we have our redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the richness of his grace, which he made to abound towards us in all wisdom and prudence, making us known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure, which he has proposed in him. Right? So one, Paul is saying, listen, this is me. I'm back and forth. I'm wishy-washy. I have a hard time, right? But here in this verse, we're told that we have been chosen. We've been elect. We've been set up according to God's good pleasure, right? And we are uh, beloved, right? And that, uh, let me see, we have redemption, forgiveness, that we have richness of grace, you know, that he'd made it abound towards us in his wisdom and prudence, right? And being made known to us the mystery of his will, right? So we obviously see, we see two sides here. We see one where it's like, man, I'm horrible. But the other one, we're like, well, this is all that God is doing for me. And this is why God loves me. And this is God's plan for me, right? And we want to focus on that side of things, right? If we want to get better in our walk, if we want to get stronger, if we want to get rid of our sin, we have to focus on who we are in Christ. So top of page three. So, old man and new man. Sarah's back. Old man and new man. Condition. The old man is crucified. Galatians 5.24. Those who belong to Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and lusts. It's dead. Amen. Romans 6.6. 6. Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with. So that we will no longer be in bondage to sin. So Paul was going, all those things I don't want to do, I do those, right? So here he's saying in Romans also, and also in Galatians, that that person is dead. We are crucifying that person, right? That that the, that condition-based person is dead to us. We have to look at it like your corpse no longer, right? I am new in Christ. I'm a new creature in Jesus Christ. I don't have to do the things I used to do. I don't have to sin. I don't have to rebel against God. I don't have to do this. So all these people are like, well, I'll always be a sinner. Only if you want to be. That's all it is. Because God loves you enough to save you from your sin, not just in your sin. Right? And that's what he wants to do is he wants to take that sin out of you, crucify that flesh, become like him. Okay, so position. New man resurrected. First man's crucified. New man resurrected. Romans 6, 4 says, We were buried therefore with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we also may walk in the newness of life. Amen. But now being made free from sin, whoo, having become servants of God, you have your fruit of sanctification and the result of eternal life, right? So that crucified, dead, sinful man that's conflicted within himself has been put away. He says we have been buried in baptism. That's why baptism is so important and died with Jesus. And then we resurrect with Jesus when we come out of the water, right? And so and so we're raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we might also walk in the newness of life. So what is that telling us? That's telling us that we don't have to be the way we were. 
-hmm. That's what it's saying. You don't have to be the old person. You want to be the new person. You want to do it the new way. You want to get rid of your sin. You want to get rid of those things that you struggle with. God wants you to get rid of it too. Okay. And he made a way. So Romans 12, one through two, it says, therefore, I urge you brothers by the mercy of God, present your bodies, a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God which is your spiritual service slash duty. Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what is good, well-pleasing, and perfect will of God. So what he's saying that, that your living sacrifice, that means your life is wholly his. You're not doing it your way anymore. But the key there on how to do that, he also tells us, is be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Renewed in your mind, right? And so if you want to be that living sacrifice, it starts here. Right now we call it the heart. You can call it whatever you want, but your brain has to make a decision that I'm not doing this anymore. Now it doesn't mean it's going to be easy all the time or you might not struggle. It just means that in here you go, no more. We're done. If I fail, I'll ask for forgiveness and I'll get up and I'll walk again with the Lord and be that living sacrifice. Okay. All right. So temporary versus eternal condition. Temporary and seen. Second Corinthians. I chopped this verse up. Mm -hmm. I'll read the whole verse in a minute. Second Corinthians 14 a and I put edit while we don't look at the things which are seen for the things which are seen are temporary this flesh temporary your problems temporary your everything around you is temporary the only thing that is eternal is any loved one that has accepted Jesus Christ and is saved that's the only thing that will be eternal okay so this everything is just a smoke screen it's not going to be here very long okay and so your flesh it is temporary position eternal and unseen second corinthians 4 18 b edit while we don't look at the things which are seen but at the things which are not seen but the things which are not seen are eternal right so you have a spirit of christ in you right you have the holy spirit you have your own personal soul and spirit right these can become eternal things these things can last forever in christ jesus and so when we're walking around this life we have to focus on what they call the inner man the inner person not the flesh, not the desires of the flesh, the pride of life and all these things. We have to focus on who we are inside. That person made new by Christ Jesus. That person that exalts and sits in high places with our Lord and Savior. That person who has new blessings and provision provided through grace and mercy and love of God, right? So to make it easy, I'm going to read the whole verse. It says 2 Corinthians 14. While we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. Focus on the eternal things. The world is really good. The lust of the eyes, pride of life, right? Especially nowadays, man, the lust of eyes is so easy. And it doesn't have to be porn. It could be like, oh, I want that car. Oh, I want that house. Oh, I want that new TV. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. And then you're constantly getting fed with, with your visual gate the things you want. And, the, and because that desire gets so big, you start compromising to meet those goals. Right. And that's the thing. So we have to learn to subdue and let our whole our spirit, the eternal part of us go. I want Christ. I want God. I want his blessing. I want his happiness. I want his provision. I want to know I'm putting a smile on his face. I want the confidence to know that I'm not caught up in my sin and that God has my back and I'm not letting a doorway for the devil to come and attack me. OK, so physical versus spiritual condition, physical, sinful flesh, Romans 7, 17. So now it is no more I that do it, but it's sin which dwells in me. Right. So that's the flesh. OK, now versus position, spiritual, sanctified spirit. First Corinthians 1, 2. To the assembly of God, which is at Corinth, those who are sanctified, which we're going to look at that word in Christ Jesus called saints, which we talked about earlier. With all who call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ in every place, both theirs and ours. So let's look at top of page four and we're going to look at the word sanctified. Okay. And so sanctified on top of page four is from the concordance in uh, Strong's Concordance G or Greek 37. It says from G40 to make holy, that is ceremonially purify or consecrate mentally to venerate, hollow, be holy and sanctified. So, so, it, so the verse says, those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus. You are made holy, you're purified, you're consecrated and set aside, right, to Jesus Christ. Now, the devil doesn't want you to know this. He wants you to think, well, I struggle with this, I feel that, I want this. And that's fine. That's eternal. That's your flat. That's less physical. It's not eternal, right? But what we have to do in order to grow in Christ is to stop thinking about those things. Mm -hmm. Subdue the flesh. Make it submit. Make it a living sacrifice. 
And your the whole power of the Holy Spirit gives you power to overcome the flesh, right? And that's why Jesus had to go out into the desert for 40 days. It says subdue his flesh, starve it, literally starve it for 40 days and then deal with temptations that apply to his flesh. You know, turn the stone into bread, throw yourself off here. I will give you the entire world. You can have anything you want. Why are you out here in the desert suffering? Right. For what good reason? You could have everything. I'll give it all to you right now. And Jesus goes, mm-mm, no. Right, get behind me, Satan. And he, and he used the Bible, thou shalt not tempt the Lord your God, right? But, you know, little little sidebar for you guys. How stupid it is. Jesus created all that. <laughs> Satan was trying to offer back to him something he made. Anyways, uh, false self versus true self. Condition, false self. Romans 7, 24. What a wretched man I am. Who will deliver me out of this body of the uh, body of this death? Right? Pause. So a wretched man, I heard and read, that was a, a form of Roman torture where they would tie a corpse, a dead body, to a human body. And as the human body, uh, the dead human body was rotting, it would start to rot the flesh of the living person. Okay, mm -hmm. and so that's what he said when he says, oh, wretched man that I am, right? He's comparing this to that, that there's two him, because if you read the whole context, he's going back and forth, right? And so he's, oh, wretched man that I am. He's being like eaten up by himself. Who will deliver me from this body of death, this thing stuck to me called the flesh that's eating me up, right? And so position, true self, 2 Corinthians 5.17, it says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a New creation. The old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Hmm. Right. So, yes, we have wretched death, man of death, sinful flesh. But in the inward man, in the person that we want to focus on, we are made new. We are new creation. One of the hardest things to stop doing is sinning just because it's habit. Ah, uh, let me tell you, I'm the king of that. I know because I, when God gave me freedom from lust, I was just so used to doing it that I was just a habit. Mm -hmm. Not that I wanted the lust. I was just so used to it that like, hmm, is what I do. And I had to go, God, I don't even desire this. Why am I, why is this happening? And then I clicked because I built a habit up. Just like people that quit smoking. God could take the way or the physical need of a cigarette. But the habit of smoking a cigarette also has to be broken. That's right. You know, and so when we get like when God gives us freedom from our flesh, we have to understand sometimes we're just doing things out of habit. You know, like cussing. You have a bad problem with cussing. Like eating popcorn about 10 o'clock. Right. You know, <laughs> and so like. You know, for me, you know, I used to cuss because I thought it was funny and it made jokes funny. But when I stopped cussing, I didn't want to do it anymore. But I still would do it because it was just a habit. I got so used to interjecting words into certain places that I was just doing it to do it because that's what I did. And so when we overcome sin and we overcome those things and we are a new creature in Christ, we have to understand just because that's popping back up, it doesn't mean that's us. It just means our flesh has developed a habit. And we have to break the habit. Okay. So, uh, outer man, inner man. Condition, outer man. 2 Corinthians 4.16. Therefore, we don't faint, but though, though our, our outward man is decaying, yet our inward man is renewed day by day. Right? Mm. So, the outward man is decaying. Every day we pass, we get older, more wrinkly, and things fall apart. Right? It gets harder to walk the earth. Okay. But it's also engaged in more sin. So next, next one, it says, yet the inward man is renewed every day. So basically think of it as a new birth every single day. So every day you wake up is a new opportunity to love Christ, a new opportunity to obey him, a new opportunity to get it right. God is the God of new opportunity because he knows we need the help. Okay. So position, inner man, Ephesians 3, 14 through 19. For this cause, I bow my knees to the father of our Lord Jesus Christ, for whom every family in heaven and on earth is named that he would grant you according to the riches of his glory, that you may be strengthened with power through this, his spirit. So where you get the power, his spirit and the inner man. So it's God upon you that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith mm -hmm, to that, to the end that you being rooted and grounded in love may be strengthened to comprehend with all the saints. What is the width length, height and depth to know Christ's love, which surpasses knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. 
right? So it says, you through faith are being renewed in the inner man by the power of the Spirit of God to help us understand the height, width, that breadth, and depth of God in Christ's love in you. So when somebody is rooting you on, now everybody looks at God like, God, oh, I'm going to sin and God's going to punch you upside the head. That's not God. If you are his child and you've repented and you're not in rebellion, God is not there to beat you up. Don't ever think God is there to kick your butt. He's not. He's there to help you. But we get this idea that God's up there with a the belt. Now, if you're in rebellion against God, he will belt you. But if you're honestly just trying to walk with God and get your life right, you fall down. Believe me, God wants to pick you up quicker than you want to get up. Okay? And so when he talks about the love of God, height, height, breadth, width, and depth, you know, he's saying like, come on, my, my kid, my son, my daughter, you can do this. I got you. I give you my spirit. Walk forward. Don't struggle. I got you. Right? And so we need to get rid of this idea. Now, Sugar Daddy God, Bible, uh, Bible study we did, what one to you if you're in a rebellion against God? He will beat you down mm -hmm. because he knows it's a, a race for your soul and he's trying to get your attention. But. If you're in humbleness and submission to God, don't fear God if you fail. Don't run from God. Run straight to him. Say, God, I am sorry. Daddy, help me. You know, and he will. He doesn't want to prolong your punishment. He doesn't want to prolong suffering. He doesn't want to beat you up like, oh, you did it again, Lance. I, I've been that in that mindset before where I felt like God was like, oh, and um, struggling with sin and stuff. And I'd be like, oh, God, I did it again. And I felt like God asked me, did what again? Because God forgets. As far as the east from the west, forgiveness is there. It's immediate. It doesn't go, well, I got a mark on the chalkboard. You do it again. Well, I got another mark. Lance, it's the third time. Three strikes, you're out. But no. So God, what God was teaching me is like, Lance, don't you understand? I forget all those things that you failed at. I, I don't make, I don't, I'm not running a scoreboard here because you are in hum, you're being humble. You're willing to submit and you want to do it right. I threw away the scoreboard. There's no scoreboard, right? Now, there's a day that we'll all have to be rewarded for our works one way or the other, but we're talking about our walk with God and how to strengthen it and get down the road with him, right? So God goes, no scoreboard. Just get up. Let's go, right? Oh, right. Stand and walk with me. Don't stop. The devil wants you to fall down, struggle, hate yourself, beat yourself up pointlessly, you know, and, and just – waste your time it's a waste of time believe me i found it was a waste of time and it did nothing for my walk with god but you know what it really does it makes you the idol of your own worship because even when you're thinking about how bad you are you're thinking about how bad you are and you're thinking about you oh yeah and so the trick is to go yeah i am bad that's why i need a savior and guess what i got one his name's jesus and guess what i don't have to stay right here anymore i can move on down that road and say god i'm sorry please forgive me moving on okay so weak and willing condition weak matthew 26 41 a watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation but the flesh is weak right i broke up the verse and position willing Matthew 26, 41, watch and pray that you don't enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak, right? And so the flesh is weak, the spirit is willing, right? In other words, the spirit of God that's in you, that's guiding you, that's filling you, that makes you the temple of God, wants you to get it right. He's not working against you. He's working for you, okay? And so we have to understand that we feel that little prick in our spirit like, oh, something's happened. That's the Holy Spirit going, hey. You don't want to do that. That's wrong. Or you're about to go do something that's going to get you in, in danger or harm. No, 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 don't go. Don't resist that. Follow that. That's God going. No, 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 don't do that. Right. And so we have to be submissive to it and listen to it. And so profitless versus filled with life condition without profit. John 6, 63 B. The flesh profits nada, zilch, nothing. Right. Butt kiss. Nothing. Okay, top of page five. Position, life, John 6, 63a. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I speak to you are spirit and are life. Mm. Right? Because we talked about being filled with the spirit of God, that spirit of life. Right? So we can't go on our desires of the flesh. 
It you know your flesh will betray you every single time. It's just the way it is. It it, it will make you do things that seem to make sense in the natural world and the natural things of exalt self, do what you need to do is get ahead. You want this, fulfill that pleasure, go do that, right? Mm, no, that's not what that's not right, right? He's saying the spirit is life. Listen to the 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 spirit. And so what the devil wants to do is give you those lusts of life. And get you not thinking about the spirit, how to feed the inner man. Now I'm telling you, it's not easy. I'm just, I'm not here to lie to anybody. It's hard to learn to do that because it's hard to deny ourselves. It's hard to not exalt ourselves or protect ourselves or do all these things. You know, it's so counterintuitive. But we have to get out of our own little boat, our little dinghy, and get into the giant yacht that God's in. And let him take care of us and let him provide and let him look out for us and let him provide our desires when he thinks it's right. Because just like a parent does to his own children, you know, yeah, you can have that, but you can't have it now. You want a pocket knife? Yes, you're four. I'll give it to you when you're nine. You know, it's like, just hold down, hold hold still for a minute. You can have one, right? But, you know, the four-year-old, no, I want it now. I can handle it, dad. No, you can't. You're going to kill yourself. It's the same thing. So God's not trying to withhold happiness from you. He's not trying to withhold joy. He's not trying to withhold the good things that your spirit desires. He's just trying to make sure that when they're given to you, they don't become a curse to you. That's right. They don't become a burden that you don't know how to handle. Okay. Sold to sin and redeemed. Conditions sold to sin. Romans 7, 14. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly sold under sin. Oh, that's right. We need a savior. Position, redeemed, which means purchased back to God. First Peter 1, 17 through 19. If you call on him as father, who without respect of person judges according to each man's work, pass the time of your living as foreigners here in re- reverent fear before God, knowing that you were redeemed, purchased back from sin. We just said you were sold under sin. You've been redeemed. You've been purchased back. Not with corruptible things, with silver or gold for the useless way of life handed down from your fathers, but with the precious blood as of a lamb without blemish or spot, the blood of Christ. So Jesus and God goes, I want you, Darian. I want you, Sarah, Lorian and Angel and Cody and mom. You know, and he goes, I'm willing to shed my blood to purchase you. You have been redeemed. So does that mean, you know, like the Bible says, you are not your own. You have been bought with a price. So if you've been redeemed back from death, do you get say in your life? No, you don't get say in your life. You've been purchased. You now belong to somebody. You belong to God. You belong to Christ. And he's going to give you good things, but you, you're, you're not your own. You don't get to make the choices anymore. And that's the trade off of salvation is that you now have a Lord and Savior that you have to submit to and follow and obey. We talked about that last week. You know, my sheep hear and obey my voice. And Jesus said, why do you call me Lord when you don't obey me? Right? And so that's what it means, Lord and Savior. Most people in Christianity want a Savior. They want a a giant Santa Claus in the sky, a fluffy friend that loves on them but doesn't require anything. No, he does require something. It's called everything, your life. You have to give it to him. And the benefits outweigh the menial cost because you're going to die anyways. So now we just get to choose the die to the flesh, live to the spirit, and get eternal life. Win, right? All right. Paul's discussion on the matter. Romans 7, 12 through 25. It says, therefore the law, we went over some of these verses a second ago, but now here's the whole discourse. Okay. Therefore the law is indeed is holy and the commandment holy and righteous and good. Sorry, but uh, did then that which is good become death to me? May it never be. But sin that it might be shown to be sin was producing death in me through that which is good, that through the commandment sin might become exceedingly sinful. In other words, the law was there to help me understand my, my, my state. In other words, God put up a standard and he allows us to look at the standard to see how far we have fallen from that standard. Okay, so verse 14, for we know that the law is spiritual, but I am fleshly sold under sin for I don't know what I am doing for I don't practice what I desire to do. But what I hate, well, that's what I do. But if what I don't desire that I do, I consent to the law that is good. So now it is no more I that do it, but sin which dwells in me. That's his flesh. For I know that in me, that is, in my flesh dwells no good thing. For desire is present with me, but I don't find it doing that which is good. In other words, the flesh is just useless. As we say, it's like, I want to do these things. I just can't because this flesh is pointless. 
For the good which I desire, I don't do. But the evil which I don't desire, that I practice. Paul's in a bad state. But if what I don't desire that I do, it is no more I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. I find then the law to me, to uh, that to me, why I desire to do good, evil is present. For I delight in God's law after the inward man, but I see a different law in my members, warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into the captivity under the law of sin, which is in my members. What a wretched man that I am, who will deliver me out of this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So then with the mind, I myself serve God's law, but with the flesh, the sin's law. Mm. So Paul is being very honest. This is like Christian being very honest. Like, listen, guys, this ain't easy. We struggle. We fight. We have to learn to overcome. Right. But we also he also talks about crucifying the flesh, being submitting to God, being a new creature in Christ. But he's trying to say that, yes, I understand your condition. We all go through it. So we all struggle. We all have issues. But God loves us enough not to leave us there. That's the whole point. Modern Christianity would be like, ah, you're saved. God will let you destroy yourself now in sin. You're still going to go to heaven. Okay. So what, I get to have hell here in my sin and eventually have heaven. God doesn't care enough to stop the pain now. He does care enough to stop the pain now. Right? Okay. So. The conclusion and fulfillment of the matter. John 3, 5 through 7. Jesus answered, Most certainly I tell you, unless one is born of water and spirit, he cannot enter in God's kingdom. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said to you, you must be uh, new. Right? So, what do we have to do? We have to be born again, right? So I'm going to read again. Jesus says, more shall I tell you, unless one is born of water and the spirit says baptism, even filled with the Holy Spirit, he cannot enter into God's kingdom. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Don't marvel that I said this to you. You must be born anew. You're even born again when you're old. Right. <laughs> That's right. All right. Top of page six. Yep. You can get it twice. Don't ask Nicodemus, though. He doesn't understand. <laughs> All right. Top of page six says flesh and blood never because right we're talking about condition flesh position spirit okay first corinthians 15 50 now i say this brothers that flesh and blood cannot inherit god's kingdom neither does the perishable inherit in imperishable right. so flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of god so don't focus on which cannot inherit the thing, kingdom of god mm -hmm. You focus on what can. So the great exchange, he goes on. This is, so that was verse 50. So this is first Corinthians 15, 51 through 58. The very next set of verses. Behold, I tell you a mystery. You will not all sleep, but we will all be changed in a moment in a twinkle of an eye at the last trump. For the trump will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and uh, we will be changed. For this perishable body must become imperishable. That's physical to spiritual. And this mortal must put on immortality again. But when this perishable body will have become imperishable and this mortal will have put on immortality, then what is written will happen. Death is swallowed up in victory. Death, where is your sting? Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin and the power of the sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the Lord's work because you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Right? So we have the Flesh cannot go to heaven. It will not inherit the kingdom of heaven, God. Don't focus on it. It's pointless. This will be transformed spiritually. You know, imperfection putting on perfection, perishable putting on imperishable, the new heavenly bodies, right? And so what should we invest our time into? Should we? Would you invest into a business that you know was going out of business? Would you put all your time and effort and money into a business that was closing down in six days? Nobody would. <laughs> Christians do it all the time, though, because that's what they're being taught in church, right? Best life now. Get rich now. God wants you to have everything now. No, God wants you to have eternity. That's what he wants. Now, it doesn't mean he doesn't want to bless you in this life, but that's not the focus. Seek first the kingdom of God, and all that will be added unto you, right? But he's saying, like, listen, this whole setup of your life is for eternity. We need a, we need a bigger picture, we need a, a bigger scope of what's going on here and not get rattled up in this like oh, this here and now. And it seems so important, you know, but if you look at a map of the galaxy, we're like a little speck, you know, in the sky. We're nothing. Right. And all that's going to be made new, new heavens, new earth, new us. Right. And um, 
So we have to keep our focus on that which is going to last forever, where we are in Christ, who we are in Christ, what he, is, what he has given us, and forsake the flesh. Yeah. Okay, so now we can fully understand this. It says, the battle that rages within us is real, we, yet we can defeat the flesh through the Spirit of God. We must choose our position to live in, not stay in our condition. So Romans 6, 12 through 14 says, mm -hmm. therefore, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. Okay, so all those people that be like, oh, it doesn't matter. God's enough. Christ is enough. Christ is enough. You don't have to do anything. No, the Bible is saying, don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. His sacrifice is enough to do what it was meant to do. But you still have a, a calling upon your life to submit and obey to him. Right. To make him Lord. So don't let sin reign in your mortal bodies. What does that mean, guys? That means we have a choice. We get to choose, don't we? We get to decide. Is it going to rain? Is it not going to rain? We all have to make that choice. It says that you should obey it in its lust. Also, do not present your members to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourself to God as alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God for sin will not have dominion over you. Hmm. Wow. For you're not under law, but under grace. So what are you saying? Don't let sin dominate your life. Don't let it dominate your desires. Don't let it dominate anything in you. You are made new. You have the power to conquer it. Now, people are like, it's so hard. Yeah, it might be hard to break some old habits and learn some new ones. But God is there with you. He can make it happen. I can confess to that. He's helped me with a lot of stuff. And I'm still learning. Everybody will learn till the day they die. It won't stop. But the thing is, is we don't have to be stuck in rebellious sin anymore. Mm -hmm. Okay? So, Romans 8, 1 through 17. Now, this is kind of long. But I thought it was so good. I did not want to chop it up. So, I put it in, in, on the sheet in bold <clears throat> uh, uh, numbers for the verses so I can keep track where we're at for everybody. It says, okay, there is then now no condemnation to those in Christ Jesus. I mean, you're not condemned. Who walk not according to the flesh, <clears throat> the condition, but according to the spirit, your position. <clears throat> for the law of the spirit of life. Sorry, guys, I made you a bigger drink. <clears throat> allergies <laughs> number two for the law of the spirit of life in christ jesus did set me free from the law of sin and of death <clears throat> for what the law was not able to do and that it was weak through the flesh god his own son having sent in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin did condemn the uh, sin in the flesh <clears throat> basically beat it up that the righteousness of the law may be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the spirit. So who do the children of God walk after? They do not walk according to the desires of the flesh. They walk according to the desires of the spirit because where the spirit is, there is life. Where the flesh reigns, there is death, right? And we are not made to die. You're a Christian. You are going to live forever. For those who are according to the flesh, to the things of the flesh do mine. And those according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. In other words, you focus on whatever you are, right? For the mind of the flesh is death and the mind of the spirit is life and peace because the mind of the flesh or the thinking of the flesh is enmity or en uh, enemy to God. For, the law, uh, for to the law of God it doth not subject itself, for neither is it able. And those who are in the flesh are not able to please God. So if we are focusing on our condition and our sinful situations, we'll not be able to do that which is pleasing to Christ, right? Verse nine, are you not in the, uh, and ye are not in the flesh, but in the spirit. If indeed the spirit of God does dwell in you. And if any of you have not the spirit of Christ, that is one is not his. So mm -hmm. if you're in the flesh and you don't have the spirit of Christ, you're not a Christian period. That's what he's saying. You don't belong to him. Okay. But if you have the spirit of Christ, then you're not going to be subjected to the flesh. You're not going to be made a victim to your own desires. Now, yes, there's a learning curve and a coming out period where you have to stop and learn and submit to Christ. But he said, this is not going to be a lifelong thing for you. You will have the victory. And if Christ is in you, the body indeed is dead because of sin and the spirit is life because of righteousness. Verse 11. And if the spirit of him who raised uh, did raise up Jesus out of the dead dwells in you, he who did raise up the Christ out of the dead shall also quicken your dying bodies through his spirit dwelling in you. Verse 12. So then, brothers, we are debtors not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. Top of page 7. Verse 13. For if according to the flesh you do live, you are about to die. 
In other words, if you walk in the flesh, you're going to die. No, you don't want that. By the spirit, the, de the, the deeds of the body you are uh, put to death and you shall live. I put the wrong version here. I'm sorry. I put an old English version. My bad. Verse 14. For as many are led by the spirit of God, those who are the sons of God. If you're led by the flesh, you're the son of the devil, you're going to die. If you're led by the spirit, you're the son of God, you're going to live, right? Verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit of bondage again to fear, but you did receive a spirit of adoption in which you cry, Abba, Father. Verse 16. The spirit himself does testify with our spirits that we're the children of God. And if children also heirs and heirs indeed of God, heirs together of Christ, if indeed we suffer together, they may also be glorified together, right? So you were called by the spirit of Christ, which makes you the child of God, to be heirs to the kingdom of God, you're set in high and heavenly places. If you're being ruled by your flesh and you will not speak to Christ, you're dead. You're dead while you live, you're dead. There's many people in the world that are dead and they don't even know they're dead. Because they have not received eternal life and not have been spiritually transformed into the image of Christ sitting in high holy places, right? And so we have to convince ourselves that, listen, I don't have to submit to old me anymore. I'm going to break the habit, right? And like the most forgotten of all spiritual gifts is this gift of self-control. That is a fruit of the spirit. Self-control, but nobody wants to talk about self-control. We all can have it, right? And so 2 Corinthians 4, 7 through 12. But we have this treasure in clay vessels, that's our bodies, that exceeding greatness of the power may be of God and not from ourselves. We are pressed on every side, yet not crushed, perplexed, yet not in despair, pursued, yet not forsaken, struck down, yet not destroyed, always carrying in the body the putting to the death of the Lord Jesus Christ, that the life of Jesus may also be revealed in our body. So what is he saying? We crucify, crucify, uh, crucify our flesh every single day. It has to be a, a thing like, no, I'm not going to submit to you. Right. And then that we represent the life of Jesus Christ. Right. The resurrection of the new man. Verse 11. We who live are always delivered to death for Jesus sake, that the life also of Jesus may be revealed in our mortal flesh. So then death works in us, but life in you. Right. And so every day we're living sacrifices. Every day we crucify that old man. Every day we let the new man rise up in us and focus on who we are in Christ. Right. And it creates barriers in a mind like old me might have done that. But new me doesn't do that anymore. I'm a new person in Christ. Right. So final thought. Now I have to apologize to my final thoughts. Two pages. So anyways, <laughs> I'm doing one of those pastor things in closing. And it's like 20 minutes later. But anyways, uh, Galatians 525. If we live by the spirit, let us also walk by the spirit. So I wrote a note. It says. Our failures in life often determine who we become. We are forced to make a decision on how we react to the circumstances that we have helped to bring about. Do we move on and shrug it off, trying to do better next time? Or do we do what most people do, crumble under the crushing guilt and get stuck in a cycle? The difference between the two groups of people is that the second group is stuck in their condition, never believing they are something much greater than just their actions. The first group knows that the, though they have failed, their failure does not determine who they are. Someone greater than they are, their father in heaven has told them, you might sin, but you are not a sinner. You're my child and I've made you a saint. And now if we can convince ourselves that God is up there cheering. You're a saint. You're a saint. You're a saint. You're no longer a sinner. Stop acting like that one. That will give us that strength and the ability to go. That's not me. Right. Now, are you ready to act like one? Our actions matter. Have no doubt about that. Yet if we have thrown off rebelling against God and have submitted to his will, then God no longer sees us as sinful flesh. He sees Jesus in his righteousness. This provides the cover we need to grow in his mercy and grace, allowing us the time and opportunity to learn to subdue the flesh and become like Jesus. Okay? Praise God. Colossians 3, 1 through 10. If then you are raised together with Christ, seek the things that are above. That's what the whole Bible study is about. Where Christ is, seated on the right hand of God. So if you're raising Christ, where are we looking? What's the plan, Father? What's the goal? Who am I? Right? And it's easy because the world wants to smash you down, especially nowadays if you're a Christian. They want to make fun of you. They want to mock you. They want to do anything. Because guess what? That's all they can do. They can't touch your soul. They can't touch your spirit. So what is this? This is grade school. Mm -hmm. Words. Right? And in North America, it's just mainly words. Now, in other parts of the country, they lose their lives, right. right? But here in America, if people just hate us or say something mean on Facebook or YouTube or Twitter or something, man, that crushes us. If our neighbors don't like us, oh, no, they don't like me. 
Big dude. Do you, do you know what that is? That's the devil trying to chink away at you who you are in Christ. To get you not focused on that. Hey, I'm a saint. I'm heir of Christ. I'm going to inherit eternity. Right? I'm going to get all things new. Amen. Right? Yeah. He doesn't want you to think about that. You're like, oh, my, my hurt little feelings. Okay. And it does hurt. I'm not trying to mock that. I'm just saying that's what he wants us to focus on. Is sit there and, and cry over our spilled milk. But Christ says, don't do that. So that's why he says, when you're persecuted, rejoice. Great is your reward in heaven. Amen. Right? And so when we go through life and we're, we're submitting the flesh, we're doing it without. Did Jesus do without earthly things? Did the Son of Man has no place to help, lay his head. He had to go in people's grain fields to eat. John the Baptist lived on locusts and honey. The disciples too, you know, Peter was like, silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have, I give to you. Holy Spirit. Right? Were they spiritually poor? No, they were stinking rich. But did they do without in this world? Yeah. Did they do without because they were living for God and serving God? Exactly. Why? Because they put their focus on what is up there, not as what is down here. Now, Jesus said, your father in heaven knows you have need of all these things, but seek first that. Right. And it'll be given to you. Now, it doesn't mean there won't be a time of crushing and proving and, and really checking your honest heart if that's really what you want. Mm -hmm. But when at the end of that road, there's a blessing. I promise you that. Right. And so even Paul, who wrote a lot of what we're reading today, talks about going hungry, shipwrecked, beaten and whipped, betrayed, backstabbed. Mm -hmm. Well, welcome to it. That's Christianity. That if you're going to live for Christ, you're going to have tribulations and persecutions. Just deal with it. Because Satan, Satan hates to know that you're up there. Mm -hmm. But he's trying to get your flesh down here. Yes, he is. Right. And so you have to go, okay, yeah, that, that hurts. And God understands the pain and the frustration. He wants to hear you cry out to him and explain your feelings about these situations. But they're not as big as we make them out to be because God is seeing eternity. He understands that the underside of all that you're going through. So when you feel like you're suffering a lot, if you feel like you're giving a lot to God, if you feel like you're doing out uh, without a lot for God, I want you to know one thing. God is looking at you and go, yeah, you're, you're going through it. But then he looks over his shoulder and sees the pile of blessings you're going to receive for it. Mm -hmm. And that's what we have to do. We have to look at the blessings that are going to come our way for what our suffering is producing here on the earth. And God was like, if I stop it now, I can't give you what I'm about to give you. So he has to make a choice like any good dad does. And he goes, no, a little longer, a little while longer. You're going to have to suffer through this. But believe me and trust me, something great is going to come of it. And the Bible says all things work to the good, uh, to those who are called according to his purpose. Right? So just trust that when you're going through this thing and you're focusing upward and you're denying your flesh, that there's something beyond the veil. There's something beyond the door. Right? And that something good is going to come of it. Now, I'm not, might not be what you want here on earth. <laughs> Believe me, I go through that with God all the time. I'm like, it's not what I want. I can tell you what I want, but I'm willing to deny what I want. Just like Jesus said, not my will, but your will be done. That's what he said in the garden. You know, Jesus is like, if there's any other way, Father, I don't want to have to do this, but I will. And that's how we have to be, right? So verse two, set your minds on the things that are above, not on the things that are on earth. For you died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. So you are in Christ. So God hasn't changed. So when he sees you, he sees Jesus, perfection, his righteousness. Mm -hmm. Verse four, when Christ, our life is revealed, then you will also be revealed with him in glory. What does that mean? Don't look past that right now for people who can't listen. I got my one hand inside of another. You're right. And you got to lift on the phone. I have one hand, my hand inside of the other. Right now we're hidden. That outward hand is Christ, the inward hand of us. And at the time of Jesus' return, this is what's going to happen. That outward hand covering my inward hand will open up and God will see us. And we will see God and we will be prepared to see him in perfection and not be destroyed because we have put on perfection. We have put on immortality. And we will not be destroyed by his righteousness because we have become his righteousness. Glory. And so that's what's going on. And that's what Satan wants you to get all messed up in your head to think that you need to somehow baby your flesh and starve your spirit. That is the exact opposite of what needs to happen. The, the thing that needs to happen is strengthen that inner man. 
So when that day comes, you can be revealed and you can see God for the first time face to face and not be destroyed. Now, the Bible says that the wicked will be destroyed by the brightness of his coming because righteousness consumes sin. And the only way you will not be consumed is if you're made perfect and made holy through the blood of Jesus Christ. Okay. Uh, verse five said, put to death, therefore, your members which are on the earth. Sexual immorality, uncleanliness, deprived passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, for which things sake the wrath of God has come on the children of disobedience. You also once walked in when you lived in them, but now you also put them away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, shameful speaking out of your mouth. I struggled with that one, and every now and then i got to watch myself on that one. Don't lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old man in his doings. Mm -hmm. So what happens when you go home and you take off your dirty clothes? You don't put on new clothes and then put the dirty clothes back on top of them. That's stupid, right? You go, done with that. That smells like dirty stank, right? right. And what does most Christians want to do? Well, I'm saying I'm a Christian. Let's put on dirty clothes on top of the clean clothes, right? All right. Number 10, and have put on the new man, which being renewed in the knowledge after the image of his creator, right? So put on that new suit, those new clothes. Right? Walk in that man. Top of page eight. <laughs> and clean clothes. And, and clean clothes, right. Dirty, stinky, sinful clothes. Forget all that business. <laughs> all right. Jesus, our example. So now that we know this, we're going to look at Jesus and how he did it. Hmm. So we can know how to do it. First Peter 2, 21 through 22. For to this you were called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving you an example that you should follow in his steps. Right? So the... What Jesus did is what we're supposed to do. Who didn't sin? What? People can stop sinning? Yes. <laughs> Believe it or not, it is possible. Neither was deceit found in his mouth. He, that's the example. It doesn't mean we won't ever sin again. But right now, we don't have to be in rebellion against God. Mm -hmm. Right? I don't lust after people. It doesn't mean I'll never lust again. But I don't have a desire. It's not my goal in life. But if I do, I have grace and mercy because it's not me. It's old man. And I can smack old man right upside the head and get the, say, get behind me, say, not me. New man doesn't do this anymore. Okay. First Peter 3, 18, because Christ also suffered for sin once, the righteous for the unrighteous, that he might bring to you, bring you to God, being put to death in the flesh, being made alive in the spirit. So he put to death the death of the flesh to be made alive in the spirit. Philipp, uh, Philippians 2, 5 through 8. Have this in your mind, which was also in Christ Jesus. So this is what Jesus was thinking. This was in his heart. Who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a servant, being made in the likeness of man and being found in human form. He humbled himself, becoming obedient to the point of death. Yes, to the death of, of the cross. So what is he saying? You have to do that. Empty yourself. Be willing to die to yourself every single day. Even if it means literal death, you have to be this way. And that's the only way. If you make any provision for the flesh, that's a hook that Satan will keep nugging and tugging at and be like, oh, I got him on this. Now, now, if you're a baby in Christ, you probably have a lot of hooks in you. And the, and the devil's trying to pull a lot of things on you. And guess what? Jesus will come over and start one by one in the power of the Holy Spirit, removing these hooks. And before you know it, you might only have one or two left. And before you know it, you will be left with one. And the only way you get there is to make a decision that I'm not doing this anymore. I am yours, Christ. Give me the Holy Spirit. Do this for me. And Christ will come in and start doing it for you. You have to make the choice. He has to make it happen. And that's how it works. Because you can't do it on your own. Nobody can. Okay. So how did Christ do everything we just read? Hebrews 12, 2. Looking to Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. Jesus looked. Amen. Right? Who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross. So what did he do? He didn't th keep his mind on the, what, the suffering. Mm -hmm. He kept on his mind on the joy. That's right. And that's what we have to do. 
Okay, it says, despising its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So what do we have to do if you're giving up smoking for Christ? Don't sit there and think, oh, I'm used to smoking right now. I got to do this. I have to get it. No, you focus on the good thing. My health will be better. I will save money. I'll be making the temple of God more pure because I will not be polluting it. You're giving up premarital sex. Same thing. You're giving up food addictions, car addictions, any kind of addiction, drugs, anything. Don't think about what you're giving up. Think about what you're gaining and who you're making happy. Think about the benefits in the end game. Okay? Said he kept he kept his focus on position, not condition. John 8, 23. He said to them, you are from beneath. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. Right? He says, you're, you're down here, guys. It's not me. I'm up here. You're down here. Deal with it. John 18 36 Jesus answered my kingdom is not of this world if my kingdom were of this world then my servants were fight that I wouldn't be delivered to the Jews but now I, my kingdom is not from here right so when we look at this world I laugh at the earth now I'm like this is a joke that's right this is all gonna burn you guys think it's so great and he's got these billionaires trying to manipulate all humanity I'm like it's gonna burn you're wasting your time you might feel great for a day but in the end it's ruined I can look at everybody that has way more than I do and be like, well, that's nice, but guess what I have in heaven? I'm filthy, stinking rich. Amen. And me and my family, we talk about it. We encourage ourselves with it because we sacrifice a lot to do this, but we talk about, okay, but in heaven, right now, waiting for us, if we do not fall back and just keep pressing forward, piles of it, come to my house, I'll share because I love you. And that's the way we have to be. And they're like, well, that's a little prideful. Area. No, that's convinced. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced of it. And the devil can try to mock me about anything. That's fine. So what? You're going to knock me off my pedestal. Right? I, guess where I'm at right now. I'm not here. I'm up there. Amen. Okay? And so in that, I can be happy. I can be joyous. I can look past situations and struggles. I can think about things. And people are like, you know, the Bible talks about the joy that passes or the peace that passes all understanding, right? Mm -hmm. In other words, it makes no sense. That's right. Or, but you're happy anyways. Okay. Yeah, because guess what? I'm not being as affected by this mm -hmm. as everybody else is. Not that it doesn't affect, not that it's hard because it's training. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I have perspective that helps me endure it. Okay? Mm -hmm. So, how we're able to do it, right? So, that's how Christ did it. Oh, wait, I think I skipped a verse. Did I skip a verse? All right. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. Okay. How we were able to do it. I did. Uh, yeah. Uh, put no confidence in your flesh. Philippians 3.3. 3, For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus. Have no confidence in your flesh. Don't trust yourself. Don't trust your desires. Don't trust the things you want. Always go, God, is this your will? Can I find it in scripture? Does it compete in the Bible with what the Bible says? Or does it confirm what the Bible says? Okay. Romans seven eighteen. For I know that in me that is in my flesh dwells no good thing. For desire is present with me, but I don't find it doing which is good. So don't trust the flesh. Next one. Realize that you can have your flesh destroyed and your spirit saved. 1 Corinthians 5, 5. And to deliver such one to Satan for the destruction of the flesh that the spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus Christ. All right? So he's talking about rebellious people. But realize that this can become crippled yuck mass and your spirit be fine and make it to heaven. Right? Next one. Understand that you can defile both your flesh and your spirit. 2 Corinthians 7, 1. Having therefore these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You can defile your spirit, man. You don't want to do that. That's rebellion against God, giving into your sins, doing that which is unpleasing in his sight, right? Rebuking the Holy Spirit when it's convicting you of a sin you need to give up. If God is convicting you now of anything you need to give up, embrace it immediately that's god's kindness and love to you that he's offering the olive branch like you need to stop this i'm here to help take this olive branch we can do this together but if you go oh not yet i'm not ready god you are in danger i'm just telling you right now you're in danger one you're you're guessing that god's going to give you another chance then he might but then he might not 
So why are you going to play games with God? Don't do that. You have the power to walk according to the Spirit and to deny the flesh. Galatians 5, 16 through 18. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one another, that you may not, may not do the things that you desire. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law, right? So you have the power to deny yourself. Don't listen to anybody say, oh, I'm just sinful. I can't stop. Yes, you can. You just don't want to. That's right. Whatever you invest in, God will reward you justly the same. Galatians 6, 7 through 8. Don't be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows that he will also reap. For he who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the spirit will for the spirit reap eternal life. Whatever basket you're putting it into. Now, Jesus and God hate it when you're lukewarm or you're doing a little flesh and a little spirit. He says, stop that. I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. Church of Laodicea. You have to determine that no, God. Help me stop feeding the flesh. Help me to do that which is pleasing in your sight. It doesn't mean you can't ever do anything fun or anything happiness. You know, it's within context of his will and what he deems to be correct will be okay. And you can still have fun in life. Believe me. All right. Indulge your inward man with the love of God and by obeying him. Romans 722a. For I delight in God's law after the inward man. All right, and then Psalms 119, 174 through 175. I have longed for your salvation, Yahweh. Your law is my delight. Let my soul live that I may praise you. Let your ordinance help me. In Ecclesiastes 12, 13, this is the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God, keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So if you want to know why you're here on earth, that's it. It doesn't mean God doesn't have some secondary objective for your life, but your primary objective is to fear God and keep his commandments. That's it. That's why you're here. If you're a Christian, you're here to fear God, keep his commandments, and then he'll have secondary objectives in your life. But he doesn't care if you can do the secondary objective if you fail at the first. Okay? So we have to obey him. We have to submit to him and do his pleasing. And at the bottom it said, forsake your condition, focus on your position. So, in closing, we have talked about how you have... Your sinful flesh and your spiritual person. Deny the sinful flesh. Focus on the spiritual man. Focus who you are in Christ. Focus on the blessings. Focus on the change. Focus that God has made you holy. Focus that you are a saint. Tell yourself, I am a saint. Build yourself up in that. I have been sanctified, made holy. I am righteousness in Christ. Yes. Right? Amen. And, and then that way, hmm. The devil can't have anything on you because you're like, well, you did this six years ago. Okay, yeah, I did. So I asked for forgiveness. Move on. Right? You did this yesterday. Okay, yeah, I forgot about that. Moving on. Right? And you just keep moving on to the goal. Right. Don't sit there and wallow in your in your rebellion and self-pity and woe is me. The, but take it from me. You have to throw things off and just keep walking. Okay? And that's the only way you get it. And God wants to help you. If you need help, just say, God, help me. I can't do it. Of course you can't. That's why we need a savior. If you could do it on your own, you could. You wouldn't need a savior, right? We all need a, a help. So let's pray. Dear Father, we glorify you. We lift you up, and we thank you so much that you have sanctified us, made us holy, uh, made us the righteousness of Christ, made us saints, made us perfect in your love, and that we are awesome in your sight and that you love us and you take joy in us and you want to help us to recover if we fail or struggle and you want us to get us down the road you're not there to beat us up if we're being humble before you and that you're there to love us and encourage us and build us up and so we accept that father we pray for everybody in this group right now and everybody online around the world and people that get the podcast father that you'll be with them and help understand who they are and that they're not that old man anymore they're the new uh people in christ so we glorify you we love you women thank you so much in jesus name we pray amen 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 amen, amen. If you feel so led of the Lord and want to know how to donate to this ministry outreach, please visit brotherlance.com and scroll down to the bottom of the main page for the PayPal link. Thank you, and may God's blessing rest upon you. Brotherlance.com